Is it Car Carmine? Yes, perfectly right. Yeah. Nice. I've seen you learn some Italian. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that was an Italian name. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, that's, pro you know, one of the reasons why I totally responded to your movie, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I hope we uh, put it Italy in a good light. It's hard not to. Yeah, right. <laughs> you have um, an I insane movie collection behind you. Oh, thank you very much. Do you, actually, you are a few years younger than I. Do you still enjoy physical copies as well? Yeah, yeah, I do. My, I actually got them. Um, a few DVDs for Christmas and it's kind of nice to have. It's just, it's hard to, I have an Xbox, so I'll put it in there and that right. sometimes plays it, but it's kind of hard to find, you know, things that are compatible with DVDs now. Absolutely. Totally right. I mean, it's so funny because, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, I grew up with them, but, but with time they sold all their DVDs, you know, and, right. but, but, you know, Sometimes they still come over and they go like, hey, that movie is, you know, it's not on Netflix, it's not on Amazon, do you have that, you know, <laughs> it's like, right. they go back to it anyway, you know, so. <laughs> okay, this is kind of a silly question, but are you ever on Apple TV flipping through and you see a movie that you think you might have, but you're too lazy to look for it, so you rent it anyways? <laughs> have you done that? I've, I've, we, I've done that a few times, actually. <laughs> Okay, happy to know that I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Seriously, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. About this very uh, beautiful movie. You know, actually my favorite movie of all time. I don't know if you know it. It's Life as a House. Do you know that one? It's, it's what? It's uh, Life as a House. No, I don't know it. All right, because it's, you know, it's with Kevin Klein and it's also, you know, a father and son story and they actually build the house together, you know, and they also have, you know, their, their differences, but it's, it's still very different from yours. So that is like okay. the only, the only connection, you know, but that's also why I responded to it, you know, so. Amazing. I have to check that out. I mean, Kevin Klein is, uh, he's a yeah, legend. And, and, and Christine Scott Thomas is also in it. Oh, amazing. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Life is a house. Yes. Life in a house. As a house? Life okay. as a house. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, first of all, you know, when uh, very early on in the movie, we get to see, you know, um, uh, Robert and Jack, you know, driving in the car and uh, they don't have a conversation together. Um, that's, of course, because they don't really like each other. Um, but, you know, it kind of reminded me, you know, whenever I drive with my father to Italy for hours, my father is a guy, he never runs out of content. He can talk like forever. Yeah. And, but my sister, you know, my sister told me, hey, when I drive with my husband to Italy, we talk for like two hours and then we just don't know what to talk about. So I was right. wondering, because of course, as actors, you, 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 you travel a lot to get to locations and stuff. So I was wondering, uh, when you are on a long journey with your dad, how do you make sure you keep the long journey entertaining? Well, in fairness, it's not ever really that entertaining. <laughs> he likes to put on BBC Radio, Radio One, um, or World News. So he'll listen to that and um, it kind of lulls me to sleep. We haven't been on a, a road trip in a long time in real life. Um, all right. But when we're in the car together, he's listening to BBC and uh, I kind of just snooze off, really. <laughs> right. Okay. Unless it's riveting news, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, um, you know, because of course their journey in the movie starts off, you know, it's, it's, it's not that they don't have a good start, but slowly they kind of find a way to reconnect. And I was yeah. wondering if you remember um, a journey that did not start that well, you know, a journey that at the beginning you were like, oh, but for whatever reason, it turned into a great one. I think the best vacations and the best trips that you have are when you're, when you're not maybe a little apprehensive to go on them. You don't, you don't have that many expectations. And, and it's, it's then when you kind of, those trips are the most special because you don't have these expectations in your mind like, oh, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be this. It's going to be that sort of going into it. And normally when it is kind of a negative, uh, you know, when you have the sort of negative thoughts of like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go on this trip. I don't that those are always the best trips. Right. They end up being. Absolutely. Yes. And, and, uh, you know, once they arrive, 
at their destination. It's so great because uh, uh, Robert's character goes like, this place hasn't changed at all. And it's so interesting because if you go, you know, to these old Italian cities or somewhere in the world, um, you see like cities and you go like, you ask yourself, yourself if, if time stands still there, because I'm sure you can relate to, you know, when you uh, grow up in a big city or stuff, you know, big cities pretty much change overnight all the time. Yeah. So I was wondering if there is something that if you will have, you know, like the, 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 the possibility to decide if there is, you know, a place or something you would actually want to protect from getting changed. If there's a place that I would want to protect from getting changed, I mean, yeah, so many. I mean, <laughs> start with the Amazon rainforest for one. Um, Ooh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there. I don't know. It's a good question. Definitely, Amazon rainforest is a big one. You know, keeping as much nature and um, you know and protecting the garden that we live in as much as possible. Um, you know, what's, what was weird about getting sent the script was the summer we read it, we had to let go of um, a family house that my grandfather had built and my mother grew up in and I sort of grew up in. And that summer we had to let go of it. And it was, it was hard because that's, it's where my mom had grown up and it's where I felt closest to her after she passed away. And we got the script that summer and along with all the similarities with our personal lives, on top of that, that it had to do with going back to this old house yeah. um, of his mother's and, and restoring it. It was, it was almost the opposite. It happened in real life. We had to let go of this place that was very old and, um, but so magical. And I hope that it, that place stays the same. You just mentioned, you know, the similarities to your life, of course. Um, and uh, Liam already said in interviews that he reacted very differently in real life than, than his character does in the movie. Um, um, because the reason, of course, why your characters are kind of at a distance is because they avoided talking with each other. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, because a lot of people do that, they kind yeah. of believe that it's better to don't talk about it. So I was wondering, um, how did you, you know, Liam and you make sure that that you stick together and that you don't allow yourselves to separate yourself from each other? Yeah, well, when it happened, I'd say the year after there was a period that it was just painful to talk about. And I think that's why most people will choose not to because it is painful to bring up and, and explore. Luckily, I had a lot of family, my mother's sisters, my aunts, uh, and my dad, and they really pressed, they really pressed that, that it isn't, that we shouldn't shut out those memories. We shouldn't not talk about my mom. Mm -hmm. It's it's about living with those memories and remembering them in the light that you saw them as, and and that I, you know, I, I don't know how to really how to grieve. I don't think anybody really does, but I I know that's one of the healthier things to do is to just cherish those memories and and try and you know, honor them in whatever way you can, whether it's cooking their recipes or listening to the music that they liked or seeing their friends, you know, I think that's how you really tie it together and honor them. Absolutely, that's, you know, also when, when, whenever I have discussions with my family about loved ones that we lost, we always try to think of something that puts a smile on our face. You know, we're like, hey, do you remember when grandpa did this crazy stuff? And, you know, right. and it always puts a smile on your face. And we don't cry, not because we don't want to cry, but we just because we feel so grateful that we had those people, people in our lives, just really. And just we just want to celebrate that time, actually. Yeah, and that's what it's about. And I would also say, like, it's OK to cry, too. I wish I cried more. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the release. And mm -hmm. so. 
sort of leaning into those strong emotions. I think it's good for people, although it's uncomfortable, but you know. Yeah, so some messages really, I don't know, sometimes you know that it's wrong to don't cry or to don't show emotions, you know it's wrong, but for whatever reason, sometimes something in you just kind of holds you back from that. Yeah. yeah. And how good do you feel though when you have like a good cry after? It's like, <gasps> you can breathe. It's like you've just done, you've meditated for an hour or something, you know? Exactly, because the thing is, if you if you don't allow yourself to grieve, because sometimes, you know, in the movie, even they say, um, um, if Robert's character says something like um, he wanted to find the, the, the fastest way out of pain, but yeah. the movie perfectly shows us that the fastest way, that, a way out of pain is not the best one. In fact, if you don't allow yourself to grieve and to face the situation, you probably, the more time passes, you're just not able to move on because there's still something unfinished within you, right? No, that's a great way of putting it. And it's just like, I don't know, you see, if you look at it at like energy, it has to go somewhere. So if you store it inside, it's going to manifest in some, in some way that might be unhealthy. So releasing it like that is probably the best way. Yeah. There is something, uh, an interesting line from, from Robert as well in the movie. He goes like, um, you, you, you can't remember and I can't forget. And it's so, those two things are like so similar because sometimes you are so annoyed that you don't remember something. And sometimes yeah. you're so annoyed that you can't forget about something. So right. how, how do you see that? What, what, is, what is more annoying or more tricky, you know, remembering something or not forgetting? <sighs> That's tricky. I would say not being able to remember something, um, mm -hmm. not being able to, although it might be a painful memory, to, to wrestle with it and understand it as opposed to not having access to it at all. Um, and I think at a younger age, that's, you know, more, more common. Equally, of course, not being able to forget something that's, that's painful. But I think that's where, that's where Robert um, was at fault in the, you know, after losing his wife was that, but no, that's why I think Robert, that's, that's why, because he hasn't come to terms with that. And he's trying to push these memories that he has out, trying to forget them, as opposed to letting them digest and resonate. And so that's why they kind of, at the start, he's just so apprehensive to going back, back to the house, whereas Jack doesn't think anything's wrong with it, because he just has this nice memory of it, you know. You know, the film's also, it's, it's got its funny parts too. That's the thing we'll do in this press because, you know, it's, it's important to talk about grief and, and that's what these characters are dealing with. And, and, you know, most people have dealt with it, but within that, there's always laughs. And even when you're grieving, you, you might start cracking up for no reason. And that's another release. And that's why I think James, our director and writer, it's it's not this like heavy heavy film. It's there's a lot of wit and, and really funny sweet moments, which I think painted in in a real you know nice way. That is exactly what I felt when I watched the movie because you know of course there is this tragedy in its core, but um, what I felt when I watched the movie was actually you know a huge sense of um, optimism and hope you know it's it's like the movie kind of <clears throat> shows us because a lot of people when something happens they um, sometimes they ask themselves do I, do I, do I want to still uh, wake up in the morning you know they just don't stand up and they just let that tragedy uh, control their lives and the movie kind of shows that there's always going to be a reason for you to enjoy life and to make you know uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, in, in the movie, of course, it's it, it's the Italian girl that that Jack uh, Jack meets. You know, there's always going to be a reason to laugh and to have fun and to enjoy life and to kind of uh, refine hope in a way. Exactly, and and I think those moments can come when you when you maybe not you don't want to go down that direction, but you you force yourself to, and then. I think those beautiful moments can happen. And I must say, you guys are really good at that, you Italians. Oh, at, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, being in touch with your emotions, you know, that's, 
Yeah, that's what I found, at least with my Italian friends. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I have to say, as an Italian, I feel very, very embarrassed to admit that I'm not able to cook. So that to is why like, I'm not able. I, you know, I remember my my uh, teacher from school, you know, that teached us cooking. And I was, you know, whenever I saw her face, I exactly knew that she doesn't want to taste what I did, but she had to because <laughs> otherwise she wouldn't be able to rate me, right? So, and of course, in the movie, you get to see that, that, that Jack and, and Robert aren't also that good. So I was wondering, uh, compared to Jack's abilities, what are your cooking skills? I'm not going to lie. I'm a pretty good cook. Oh. <laughs> I like cooking. I mean, pasta, it's, I mean, it's such a classic thing, but pasta is probably one of the better things I can cook. Uh, my mom, that was her, you know, biggest hobby was cooking so I, I got a lot of recipes from her and it's fun you know like just doing things with your hands creating something it's um I yeah I really enjoy it but you know I don't blame you man because if you go to a if you go to a grocery store you can open a jar of of amazing meat sauce and throw it in a pot and then you're you're good exactly <laughs> as yeah. opposed to here I mean it's a little yeah maybe not so fresh but the great thing for you is you can call your dad and say, hey, I've made some delicious ragu you have to taste. Come on over, man. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also, you know, there's a scene in the movie where, where uh, your character goes like, my whole childhood is in this uh, room. And yeah. it kind of remembered me, you know, when, when sometimes I think, you know, today, how will my childhood room look like, you know? And I was wondering if, if you would actually recreate your childhood in a room, you know, with toys and, and posters, whatever, what will be all in that room? Okay. I think a Liverpool po poster for sure. Ooh, all right. Uh, I was a huge Avril Lavigne fan growing up. So, I yes. don't know if you know, you know Avril Lavigne, okay. Yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was obsessed with Avril Lavigne, so there was probably an Avril Lavigne poster there was a My Chemical Romance poster for sure. Oh. Um, definitely a Pokemon, Digimon. I don't know if you remember Digimon. I am obsessed with Digimon. I, took, <laughs> I still am. This is so great. I, I, I loved it. So those, those guys would be there. Um, I don't know, probably some like weird lava lamp and... <laughs> This is a good question. And Lord of the Rings. I would have a Lord of the Rings poster, maybe the, the book set. Of course. And I think that that's it. Maybe a, a couple of Harry Potter things, but I was more Lord of the Rings guy or kid. Right. But it's so interesting, you know, I remember when I was like, you know, like around 13, you know, the age you had to start to be cool, you know. I remember, you know, some, some schoolmates telling me, what you you bought Pokemon cards? Aren't you too old for that? You know, and today you hear like people in their twenties and thirties buying Pokemon cards, and you go like, why was it an issue back then? You know. <laughs> I know, and if you can find that old Pokemon collection, maybe you might you might have some serious money on your hands. A very um, rare Charizard card might come up. Who knows? Those things go for like a lot of money. It's crazy. Right. I regret a lot that I sold back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not I never knew I never knew how to play the card games. I just would collect them and you'd look at them because they were cool, but I never knew how to play Pokemon or anything like that. Same. When you know when we, even when I went to the store, you know, they had like, you know, like a place, you know, where you could play with others, you know, and they were like, Okay, you, you bought them, do you want to play with us? And I was like, No, 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 I just collect them just for to, to look at them, you know, and to have the rare ones and stuff, you know, but <laughs> And yeah, I, I, you know, it's actually ridiculous that even after 20 years, that that's something you collected for so long, you still don't know how it works. Well, how it works, right. <laughs> well, I, this is kind of a side topic. I don't know if you know Warhammer, if you guys have it. It's, um, there are uh, these that's... little figures that you paint and they, I, it was a big sensation. I think still is that you, it's, it's, it's not like a board game. You pretty much, um, create the own landscape and then you get these little figures and you paint them but as a kid you would walk by and you would see all these like action figures that have been painted you're like wow what is this game it looks amazing and then you go in and you realize 
that the people who paint these figures are 30 year olds who've been painting their whole lives and they expect these little kids to come in and start from scratch and paint them and then also understand the game and it's like <laughs> uh, yeah i don't yeah sidetracked it but respect to warhammer uh, Michael, I've seen that we uh, crossed the 15 minutes. Would you mind like two last questions? Yeah, go for it. Awesome. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, one would be, you know, like, because, you know, uh, Natalie tells uh, Jack, of course, you want to impress your father, you know, um, uh, with painting and everything. And I was wondering if that is something you can relate to, you know, if you, if you ever wanted, you know, to have his approval on, on your acting. Well, I think for every son, um, you you want to gain your father's respect in some way and and yeah. you know make them proud i think that's inherent for you know most kids not just sons daughters sons to make their parents proud and um i think it can get dangerous you know if you try and live up to certain things i think in some way you just have to choose your own path and work hard at it yeah and through that you know, you know at least at least i've you know, my dad is is proud of me in in that capacity. That is that is wonderful, and I'm sure you're proud of him as well, right? <laughs> of course, yeah. He's just not a bad actor, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's 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 uh, he's he's fine. <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, this also, you know, he has also also has a great line. You know, he goes like. Um, uh, don't don't enter a marriage before 35, you know, because we, be, be, before that we we guys don't know who we are, you know. So I'm I'm uh, I am not that far away from turning 35, and I still have some more clues sometimes. So I was wondering, okay. do you have a clue? No. Uh, <laughs> okay. I think that's a good rule to live by. <laughs> yeah, I re there are people. I have some friends who are getting married now, and it's it's great, but for me personally i'm still figuring out who i am and i feel like i only know half of it and so 35 seems like a safe age 10 years from now maybe i'll have a little more of an understanding and then i can sort of take care of my loved one <laughs> my wife <laughs> yeah. or maybe not if you are like an italian like me <laughs> or maybe not that is that wouldn't be bad life either i don't blame you yeah. It's no rush. It's no rush. Right. Um, Michael, you, I seriously, I cannot tell you how much I enjoy talking to you. Thank you so much for joining oh. us today. Seriously, and Thanks, I, it was a pleasure, man. And, and you're, yeah, I, I love the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael. And seriously, I hope we get to learn together how to play Digimon and Pokemon one day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe we can well, teach each other. <laughs> I'll bring, I'll bring my collection. You bring yours. We'll have oh, a beer. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll play some Digimon. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that in Italy. <laughs> okay, let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Michael, again, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too, Carmen. Appreciate Thank you it. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.